How, how, how's everyone doing today? Okay? Good? How about any not so goods? Any terribles? No? Everyone's doing just fine. I don't believe you guys, but anyway, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, today we're going to be continuing our series in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be taking verses 1 to 7 this morning. Um, in the verses that we go through today, Peter talks to these very early Christians about how they are re- to relate to one another as spouses. And as you probably guessed already by the video that we had this morning, this morning's passage deals a lot with marriage. And so you might think, well, if you're single, you shouldn't be here today, but that's not the case at all because this scripture is not just for those who are married, but rather it's for all of us. Um, there's such a wonderful wonderful parallel here to our relationship with Jesus. We are the bride of Christ as a body of believers together. And so what I'd like to do now, we'll just watch the scripture video and uh, you can follow along in your Bibles or on your Bible app if you want, on your iPhone or your iPod, or maybe you have a Samsung Galaxy like me, then you would be great. That's good. We also have uh, Bibles at the back. If you don't have one and you would like to follow along, you can grab one. It's our gift to you if you don't have one. Anyway, let's watch the video, and then we'll continue on. Reading from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So before we dig into these verses, um, I'm going to need a lot of prayer from you guys as I go through this, so that What I say and what I mean all comes out correctly, and you guys hear the message that God has for you this morning. So let's just pray, and if you guys can pray along with me in your minds, whatever, just pray for me as we go through this. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of the gospel, the story that makes you our hero and our savior. We thank you for the instructions you have for us today on how we should live in a marriage um, in light of the fact that we've been saved by you and loved by you. Lord, we thank you that even if we're not in a marriage situation right now, whether we are married no longer or if a spouse has passed away or maybe we've never been married, you are our ultimate husband, Jesus. You are the perfect Jesus who loved us so much that you submitted your life to the death on the cross for us so that we could be saved and made pure for you so that we could worship and honor you, God. Jesus, this is all about you. And I just pray that today you would help us as we go through these verses. Um, give life-changing understanding of these words today. Instead of just intellectual knowledge of these words, which which can so often lure us into a false sense of relationship with you, God, I just pray that you would help us to truly love you as we should. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Now, like I've mentioned so many times before, uh, we here at Grace Fellowship, we go through books of the Bible, and so when we get to subjects that are unpopular or controversial, we can't just skip over them and not address them at all. We feel that if the Bible addresses certain issues, that we should address them as well. And so um, because of that, we are in First Peter chapter 3 today. It, it does seem, however, that I get stuck with these unpopular subjects on a regular basis, you might notice. And so today, the very first verse that we're going to go through is one of those verses that we as a North American culture have really despised or we we vilified it or demonized it. At first glance, when we interpret it through the lens of the culture today, uh, it seems as though 
it maybe degrades women to something lower than men, even though that's not the intent when it was written. And so we always have to take the context of the words with the words themselves to understand what they really mean. So let's read verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. This verse is not really well liked among anybody today, including Christians, as it implies that one person is more important than the other, namely the husband is more important than the wife. And it goes against all thinking in today's equality and self-love and personal satisfaction culture. But if we look at it within context, we find that Peter was never implying that the husband was better or more important than the wife in their relationship. Peter tells these these new Christians that were exiled to, to other areas, they were not in their home country anymore. Um, he tells these Christian wives to be subject to their own husbands, or depending on the version of the Bible that you have, it might say they are to submit to their husbands. And this is very unpopular teaching today, and I feel like maybe I need to unteach um, some of what culture has taught us submission means before we get into what it really means here in 1 Peter. To many of us, uh, being in submission or being subject to someone is a very negative thing. We don't like this. It's uncomfortable. We don't like to think of ourselves as being under someone else. When we think of submission or being subject to someone, you think of maybe a forced authority over you. And I don't know how many of you watch, watch wrestling, um, and I'm not talking the WWE or WWF, depending on how old you are, wrestling, but I'm talking about, you know, the real wrestling like would be at the Summer Olympics, but um, I think the wrestling world has hijacked our word of submission. And how they use it is not how Peter was using it in the book of 1 Peter. There's a sport that's called wrestling or submission wrestling. And um, it's, it's between two opponents. And, and one of the wrestlers wins when he's able to put the other wrestler in a, in a position that renders him unable to do anything more. And he has to tap his hand on the ground or tap out um, and signifying that he submits to the one that's holding him in that position, and he can't do anything more. That's not the kind of submission that Peter's talking about here. I want you to know that. Husbands, don't do this to your wives. <laughs> and I'm not talking just about physical submission, but rather this, this forced emotional um, or relational or mental submission or subjectivity. I, I want you to notice how different this wrestling submission is to the type of submission that Peter is talking about here. In wrestling, the goal is to make the other person submit to your will. Whereas in marriage, Peter never once commands the husband to ever make his wife submit. I want you to notice that. The husband is never commanded to make his wife submit. I want you to notice that we're going to be going through the, the husband's role shortly, I guess, but he commanded to lead but he does never commands to put your wife down and force your wife to submit. He asks the wives to do this submitting on their own, out of their own free will. It would be like an opponent walking into a wrestling ring and kneeling down and giving the match to their opponent willingly without any force, without any forced submission at all. This is something that would be done out of a love for the husband. It's the exact same thing that you would do for a friend. You might ask your friend, hey, what do you, you, know, what do you want to do tonight? Whatever you want, I'm game. And the reason you feel confident in telling your friend to choose the activity is because your friend loves you and would never choose something that's way out of line with what you were comfortable with. You just submitted to your friend. You said, just, I'll do whatever you want. It's a submission. But you know that your friend would probably try to choose something that you would enjoy and you would love because they love you. That would be submitting to your friend's will. And in turn, they love you so much, they choose to do something that you would have chosen anyway. Some husbands are, are, are probably thinking after they read the first verse, they're like, sweet man, I'm sure glad Mark is talking about this uh, wife submitting stuff, because my wife really needs to hear this. But 
You see, if that's the case, case, you probably have a larger problem, and it's probably not with your wife, but rather with you as a husband and how you love your wife that she does not want to be in full protective submission to you. And I'll get to you in a bit, but right now I'm, I'm going to address the wives for a while. You see, this whole time in First Peter, we've been going through Peter's instructions to these exile Christians. He instructs them on how to relate to community, how to relate to government, how to relate to other types of authority in their life, and now how to relate to each other as spouses. And I want you to notice at the beginning of verse 1, he starts with the word likewise, which means he's referring back to the previous piece of text where he gave very specific instructions on how everyone is to submit willingly to the authority in their lives in every way that you can with a clean conscience and still serving Christ. And now, just like that, or likewise, wives, you're to submit to the authority that God has given your husband over you. Now, wives, I also want you to notice that this authority is not something that your husband has earned. Husbands, you do not deserve to have a loving authority over your wives. You are often very incompetent in that authority that God has given you. I want you to know this. I know that I notice this very much in, in my own life. And my wife will confirm it if you ask her, but the authority that God has given me over her is not something that I have earned. I don't deserve this kind of authority over her. Sometimes you as a husband or me as a husband, we are unfair, we are jerks, and maybe we just generally suck as husbands. I'm a husband, and so I know how much I don't deserve the blessing of having my wife in my life. And I know many of you probably suck at being husbands just like I do. But don't worry. God has not called us to earn this authority over our wives. He has given it to us, but we are to love our wives in that authority. And so wives, your your submission to your husband never depends on how good of a husband you have. Just like Peter went through in the government portion of the text, which we've been going through the last two weeks, where the government was actually very terrible and completely unfair. They were against Christianity. The early Christians were still called to be in a submission to that government as much as possible in whatever way they could. They were the ones to make the community a better place so that the gospel would spread even just by their actions and love for that community. They were to live in such a way that no one could ever say anything bad about them. I like to think that this is the same type of submission that Peter's talking about in relation to husbands and wives. The wives are to live in such a way that the home that they are a part of is a better place because they are there. Even if the husband is not a loving husband or not a Christian husband, they would have to admit that their lives are better because their wives are in their life. There should be nothing about the wife's conduct that they find offensive other than the gospel that's at work in their lives. This is a command to the wives that really is not an easy command. We husbands don't deserve this kind of submission, least of all me. And if you ever need to know the real me, just ask Alicia. She will vouch for me that I totally don't deserve the submission that the Bible calls her to. But she's gracious enough to offer it to me. In fact, husbands are often like governments who abuse their authority. And and especially at the time that Peter was writing to these believers, the government didn't deserve to be subject to. Yet for the cause of the gospel, we were called to submit to the government. Wives, it's similar to you. Your husband may not deserve the submission that Peter calls you to. But like we see at the end of verse 1 and at the beginning of verse 2, it is for the cause of the gospel. I'll just read part of that there, so that even if some do not obey the word, they might be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Again, this life is not about us, as we see. It's about Jesus. You see, your conduct is not to make your life better or your marriage better, even though that very well may happen in the process. But that's not the primary point. Again, these instructions to wives are so that their husbands, even if they are not believers, They will see their wives' conduct and glorify God. See, it's all about God. It's all about Jesus and the gospel. It's not about us. We see this over and over again in the book of 1 Peter. So even if your husband is a complete unbeliever, by by your conduct, 
you could possibly win him for Christ. You see, when it says, without a word, you will win him, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't speak. On the contrary, you as a wife should be speaking the gospel to your husband, even if he is a Christian. But Peter is getting to the point here that even if your husband is so sick in the head that he does not allow you to tell him about the gospel that has saved you, your actions will speak to his heart despite his unwillingness to hear. This is all about Jesus. It's all about more people knowing Jesus and giving him more honor and more glory. It's not about us. This submission thing is not about us. When Peter was addressing the people and telling them to submit to government, it wasn't about them. Many of them were still killed and tortured. But it was about the honor and the glory of Jesus. Through our actions, we are appointing others to him. Wives, through your actions day by day, are you pointing your husband to Jesus? Whether he is a believer or not, even a believing husband like myself needs to be pointed to Jesus daily. And Alicia does that for me by the way she shows, shows me Jesus and how she lives her life with me. And then Peter moves on to verse 3 and 4, and he's, and he's still talking to wives here. We got a lot to chew through for the wives. We got one verse at the end that speaks to the husband. But verse 3 and 4, do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, which is with the imperishable beauty of a gentle spirit or a gentle and a quiet spirit in which God's sight is very precious. Let's start with verse three where, where Peter says, don't let your adorning be on the outside, but let it be on the inside. Don't let your adorning be your hair, your jewelry, your clothes. It should not be who you are. This is not your identity, the outside I think very often this gets misinterpreted as well, along with the, the submission um, um, verses. And again, maybe I'll try to reverse some of that popular teaching about this, because I think throughout uh, the very recent Christian history, we have badly, badly misinterpreted this. I think we have made this to mean at times that women should dress as least attractively as possible. And that's not what they're talking about here. Um, God... You know, this is not the meaning of what he's trying to say here at all. God's made women beautiful, and this is a fact. Men are not beautiful. You guys know that? Men, we are not beautiful. Women are beautiful, and God created them to be beautiful. But Peter's point here is that the most beautiful part of you should not be the outside. The most beautiful thing about you should not be your hair, your jewelry, your status, your clothes, your confidence, or your abilities, or your job, whatever it is, your heart and your love for others and your love for Jesus should be the most beautiful part of you. It should not ma matter how beautiful you feel you are on the outside, as your love for Jesus should way overshadow the outward beauty that he created you with. That's the hard part. Peter's telling these women that the most beautiful, beautiful thing about them should always be their love for Jesus. This is so that their husbands and the people around them who they interact with see Jesus in their lives. In fact, in verse 5, Five and six, he says this, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abram, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. He uses this example of Sarah from thousands of years earlier to bring his point across. Sarah was beautiful on the inside, and she subjected herself to her husband or submitted to her husband, even going so far as to call him Lord. She was far more beautiful on the inside than she was on the outside. Her actions and submission showed her love for her husband and for her God. And that's what made her so beautiful. Her beauty, her beauty coming from the inside and shining outwards. Did this mean she dressed unattractively or poorly just to make sure her heart was more beautiful than she looked on the outside? No, that's, that, that's backwards thinking. In fact, Abraham... Sarah's husband lied to two kings throughout his travels because his wife was so beautiful on the outside that he didn't want to be killed and have them take Sarah for themselves. Let's read Genesis chapter 12, verses 11 to 14. This is Abram here. And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw 
that the woman was very beautiful. Essentially, Abram was saying, just say you're my sister because you look too good to be my wife. Sarah was beautiful on the outside as well as on the inside. But her, her real true beauty, the one that really stood out, was the inner beauty. When you got to know her, you would love her even more because what was on the inside far surpassed any beauty that was on the outside, even though she was incredibly beautiful on the outside. The kings lusted after her and wanted her. In the world, the problem has been that the outward beauty has been, um, or the importance on the outward beauty has been amplified so much, and the inner beauty has all been forgotten. And in the church, the problem really hasn't been reversed, but it's been different. Instead of amplifying and celebrating a woman's inner beauty, uh, we've just made women feel as though it's sinful to have outer beauty even though God created women beautiful. In both of these scenarios, we've totally forgotten about the inner beauty. In both cases, this is sin. We've forgotten and not taught what it means to cultivate that inner beauty, that relationship with Jesus Christ, to far outshine any outer beauty, that the outside really becomes secondary. The inside is who you are, not your outward appearance. This is God's intention for you. I'm going to do something that's a little strange and awkward here. And I'm sorry, women, you're going to have to forgive me. But I think in order for us men to get this, um, I'm going to have to put it in uh, terms that we men kind of understand. Uh, We men struggle with this inner beauty thing, and and we don't really get it. So I'm going to to explain this concept in in terms of of cars. (laughs) I'm sorry for comparing you to cars, women. I don't mean to do it, but I think that men need to hear this to get it. Um, I have two neighbors, one to the left of my house and one to the right of my house. Both have two, or each neighbor has a fairly new sports car. They're both the same kind of car. And to tell you the honest truth, they're one of my favorite cars. They're both Chevrolet Camaros. Now, the neighbor to the right of my house, the color of his car is beautiful. It's lime green, It has nice blacked out wheels, all the ground effects. It's got racing stripes. Um, Beautiful looking car, has all the options on the outside. The neighbor to my left has a white plain Camaro, or it looks plain anyway. Now, they look similar other than the color and all the extra options on the green one. It just looks beautiful from the outside. It's got really nice wheels and everything. The white one definitely does not look very flashy at all. And the white one is definitely not as in your face as the lime green car. The wheels are stock wheels. There's nothing really fancy there. It just looks like a plain Camaro. But when my neighbor with a fancy green car starts his car, you know what I hear? Nothing. It's one of these cheap little V6 models that only has like as much power as, say, an average Toyota Camry or some family car like that. And that is the model that this beautiful green Camaro is. You know, you see it, it's a beautiful car, but you start it up, you hear nothing. It's just quiet, you know. You would get a lot of heads turning when you drive it, but you'd soon be very, very disappointed um, that it's no faster than your average family car nor does it sound like the muscle car that it's pretending to be. All of, these car, or all of this car's beauty is on the outside, and that's it. What's under the hood really disappoints. But when my other neighbor with the white, plain-looking Camaro starts it up, starts his Camaro, it actually wakes me up in the morning if he starts it. It's nice and loud. You know, I like that. I'm a guy. I like cars. I like Camaros. It's got, you know, a big V8 engine in there. When you drive it, you're going to soon find out that this car is a lot faster and a lot more fun to drive than that beautiful green car. The beauty of the plain white car is underneath the hood. It still looks good on the outside. It's not as nice as the green one. But the real treat, what are, are the inner workings of that car, that 426 horsepower V8 heart. That is the beauty of that car right there. And when you drive it, 
You will love it. Guys, it's, that's kind of like the inner beauty of a woman. What's on the inside is just so much more important than what's on the outside. Women, your inward beauty is so much more important to us than any outward beauty. Let your inward beauty be such that it far outshines the amazing outward beauty that God has given all of you women. That's what matters. That's what will bring others to Christ, the inward beauty of a heart that is changed by Jesus in the gospel. Husbands, as you will see, Peter spent the first six verses on wives and verse number seven on husbands. Now, this might seem like, oh, sweet, I got off easy. There's just a little verse at the end about husbands, what they have to do to their wives. Um, but to tell you the honest truth, this would have been very countercultural at the time as women were often treated as property rather than, than the people that God created them to be. But here we see that Peter addressed the women first, giving them a higher place of honor in this text than men. And so he addresses them first. In the culture of the time, it would have been customary to not even address women at all. Many times women were just left out. And so we see here that women hold a high place of honor in Peter's heart. This would have been so wrong for the culture at the time, and yet this is how Peter addresses them anyway. And then Peter moves on in verse 7. He says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, those are often fighting words. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. He starts off with the word likewise again in verse 7. So just like we were all to submit to government and all other authority, and just like women were to be subject to their husbands and be in submission to them, now the husbands, because of that word likewise, were to live a certain way with their wives. They're to be understanding. I struggle in this area. I am not the most understanding person. Many of you will know that. I tend to be more judgmental. That's my spiritual gift. Uh, that's not a spiritual gift, <laughs> but that's where I tend to be. Um, husbands here to give your wives understanding, even when it seems as though they're wrong. We're to show them honor as the weaker vessel. Now, people often look at this verse in horror. They're like, what? Women, women are the weak, weaker vessel? That's so sexist, you know? They can do anything a man can do. And I, and I want you to notice the context here. Peter specifically says to show them honor as you would honor a weaker vessel. When you go, say, into an art gallery, there is some precious, valuable art there. Maybe some statues or paintings or whatever it is. If it's on display in a large art gallery, it is always worth more than my, my average paycheck. You're never allowed to touch the art because it's very precious and valuable. It is often fragile and easy to destroy. Very valuable art can be destroyed very quickly and very easily. Husbands, it's very easy for you to destroy your precious, incredibly valuable, beautiful wives. Peter knows this. Peter's married and he has a wife. Can you imagine being Peter? I, I just found this really funny. Peter wrote this and he is, he's married at the time. He writes that wives are to submit to their husbands. Can you imagine his wife being like, well, that's not in the Bible, um, so I don't have to listen to you. And Peter being like, well, yeah, I wrote it. And now it's in the Bible, so neener, neener, neener. But I'm sure that's not how it went down. But, but Peter is, what Peter's getting at here is saying that women, as the weaker vessel, are very valuable. They're precious. And so you have to protect them and love them and honor them like a thousand times more than you would, you would honor a very valuable piece of art. You see, this was never intended to be a one-way street in marriage. Men and women might be very different, but both are valued more than you can imagine as children of God. Men, another reason you're to honor your wife and value her so highly is that if she also believes in Jesus as you do, then you and your wife are fellow heirs of God's grace, of this wonderful inheritance of eternal life. You see, when this was written, this would have been revolutionary. Women did not inherit stuff. Men did. It was always the sons who inherited the family fortune. With very few exceptions throughout the Old Testament history where women actually inherited something. And now Peter is elevating women to the point where they will inherit this grace and mercy together with their husbands. They're one. Peter even goes as far to say, if you are not treating your wife with honor, your prayers will be hindered. I can personally attest to this. You see, I've had times in my life where I've not honored my wife 
as I should have. And if you ask her again, she, she would confirm that fact. And I will probably have more times like that when I'm not honoring the gift that God has given me as I should. The gift of my wife and my relationship with Jesus will suffer because she is a gift from Jesus. There are times when, when I can hardly talk to God because I felt this overwhelming sense of guilt because I've not treated this gift from God with the honor that she deserves. I like the way Paul puts um, the same sort of instructions in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. I want to read those verses just to clarify this. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy, without blemish. In the same way, husbands, you should love your wives as their own bodies. Husbands, it's your job to love your wife the way that Christ has loved the church, meaning you. He loved you so much that he would do anything for you, including death. Love your wives. You see, the way this is supposed to work is that it's a two-way street. The husband loves his wife with such a, such a pure love that he would serve her in every way possible. And the wife, seeing this intense love for her, that her husband has for her, she just submits to his leadership because she knows that he has her best interest in mind. He loves her enough to do anything for her, and she loves him enough to just trust him with her life. This is a pure love for each other. You know, the, the, this perfect type of marriage is, is just a clear picture of the gospel. It's a, it's a picture of all of us under Christ submitting to everything he has for us because he loved us so much that he died for us. We as a church are the bride of Christ. God gave us this picture of marriage to help us see the truth of the gospel. So often we think it's the other way around. But when you get the gospel, the true story of how God loves you so much that he would do anything for you, then being subject to to him as a king is no problem because you know he has your best interest in mind. It's the same in a marriage. And it's the same in a government. If we vote for a government and the party we voted for does not get in, we have trouble being subject to them because we didn't vote for them and we feel as though they don't have our best interest in mind. But when the party that a person votes for gets in, we're happy to be under their leadership because we feel that they have our back, right? We voted for them. And it seemed as though our lives were in our situation would be better because they're in power. The same, it's supposed to be the same way with wives and husbands. We should feel as though we've chosen them because our lives will be better because they are in authority over us or we're submitting to them or we're loving them and serving them. And you see, God is the ultimate husband. He has the ultimate power. He is the king of kings. And he's giving this, the amazing gift of actually being his bride as the church of Christ. If you think about that, we as a church are the queen of the king of kings. He has our backs. He died for us and he rose for us and he loves us more than we can imagine. And so because of that, I submit my life to him as a wife submits to her loving husband for him to use however he pleases because she knows that the husband loves her so much that he's only going to do what's best for her. Just like if we love God so much and we submit to him, we're going to give everything to him and love him so much. And we'll say, just use us because we know that he has our eternal inheritance for us and our best interest in mind. You see, what I just described to you was the perfect marriage in the story of the gospel, but there are marriages that this will not work in. In many marriages, it will not be that two-way street. Either the wife will be in loving submission to her husband and her husband's not going to love her as he should, or the husband is going to be a jerk. Or maybe the husband's going to love his wife unconditionally and his wife will, will not come under his loving leadership. She's going to resist. And this might be the case for you. You see, that's also a picture of the gospel story. In fact, the gospel story is a lot messier than we like to imagine. If we as a church are the bride of Christ then Christ has a bride that has made a lot of mistakes and has had a lot of blemishes. You see, Christ, although he loves us as people unconditionally, there are many who reject him. 
And just like a wife who will reject her husband or a husband who rejects his wife, we have rejected Jesus. But that didn't stop Jesus, and so it shouldn't stop you. God's love for us is unconditional, and so should your love for your spouse be. You see, nowhere did Peter say, wives, if your husband loves you unconditionally, you should submit your life to him. Nor did he say, husbands, if your wife devotes her life to you and submits to you, you should love her. He never gave those instructions. And so you as a wife might submit your life and, and you might love a man that may never love you back. Or you as a husband may love a wife with all your heart and she does not love you back or fall under your leadership. This can most certainly happen in life. But it doesn't take the responsibility off of you to be that person that Christ called you to be. You see, the same thing has happened to Jesus. He gave his life for us. Even while we rejected him and refused his salvation and refused his gift of eternal life, that didn't stop him from dying for us. He loved us unconditionally before we ever loved him back. Let's offer the same grace that Jesus offered us to our spouses so that God will be honored and glorified in all of our lives. Maybe you can reach the one that's hurt and rejected you by the grace that you offer them. Just as Jesus offered grace and mercy to the ones that rejected him, you and I, so when we think about the grace that Jesus has given us, his mercy, let's let that compel us to offer grace and mercy to the people around us, especially our spouses.